just by creating small things on a daily basis, whether that's taking pictures or cooking meals with intention, or you start to build that business that everyone told you you were crazy to build, it's a signal for something bigger. It's a signal that you have agency over your life. And when you start to create your life, amazing things happen. Welcome, everybody. This is For the Love of Money, where we are making you unapologetic about your pursuit of success by sharing the tools, tips, and stories of those who have already made it. My name is Chris Harder, and each week I will bring you incredible guests in order to prove that when good people make good money, they do great things. Hey, everybody, welcome back to another incredible episode of For the Love of Money. I cannot wait for you to hear my guest, Chase Jarvis, today. You probably already know or follow Chase because he's the award-winning photographer and director and artist and entrepreneur and app developer, like you name it. Everything he touches turns to gold and he ends up holding some kind of award for it, which is amazing. As a matter of fact, He's also the co-founder of Creative Live, the online educational platform that just happens to be the largest live streaming platform in the world for teaching creatives how to excel in their career. How freaking amazing is that? Now, I met Chase about a year ago and instantly fell in love with him because of his zest for life and for adventure and the way that he loves and works with his wife, just like I do, and really just how dang smart he is. His ability to frame things and accomplish things is really second to none. So get ready because we're going to dive in together and you're going to learn about how to pursue your creative passion instead of being stuck in a job that, let's be honest, other people expect you to stay in. Like a lot of us are staying in routes because we're afraid of disappointing other people. Well, he's got a story that'll break you free of that. You're going to learn where this this wildly stupid notion comes from, that artists have to be struggling. And you'll be inspired, as a matter of fact, by his link between being a creative and being an entrepreneur. You're going to love his heart for generosity. As a matter of fact, we even have a little surprise for him at the end regarding his philanthropic goals. So make sure you catch that surprise at the end. But last but not least... Chase drops some advice from his new book, Creative Calling, that will unlock so many important parts of your life. Just for this advice alone is worth the next 30, 40, 45 minutes of your very valuable time. So get ready and like really tune in because this episode is one of those that will be an absolute game changer for you. And I have to tell you, I wouldn't even know Chase and he wouldn't even be on this show right now if it weren't for a mastermind that I was in last year where he came to speak and educate us. I sat there with my jaw dropped at how he shifted my business and my life and how he shifted Lori's business and Lori's life in really just 90 minutes of sitting down learning from him. And this is why we put together masterminds is so that you can have that experience too. And I've got to tell you, our, our entry-level one, Fast Foundations, is on fire and off the charts. And we are getting towards the end of the season for our elite mastermind, which lasts all year long. And because we're at the end of the season, that means we're going to be filling this thing pretty soon. So if you want to apply for our elite-level mastermind, where you learn from not just myself and my team, but our very smart and very accomplished friends, then make sure you go to fortheloveofmoney.com forward slash mastermind. fortheloveofmoney.com forward slash mastermind. Because not only are all the answers to your questions there, not only will you get a great idea of you know, what it's about and, and why we create magic, but you'll get a chance to apply. Because the way we fill this thing is first come, first serve, and by doing uh, having a quick phone conversation, you and I, to make sure you're a great fit. I take building this elite level mastermind so seriously that I make sure that every individual person in there is a perfect fit for the culture that I want to create for each other. Because it's not just learning from ourselves and our celebrity entrepreneur friends, but it's learning from each other. And that only happens when everybody treats each other 
like a true family for that one year that we come together and work on each other's business. So listen, if this is for you, if you make over half a million dollars a year or more, most people are in there are upwards of a million or multiple millions. And if you want to learn how to break that seven-figure barrier, not just like creep over it, but smash it, get into the multiple seven figures over the course of the next year, then go apply right now. Check it out at fortheloveofmoney.com forward slash mastermind. I can't wait to learn about your business. Jump on the phone and have you and I just have a quick little chat about it. Check it out fortheloveofmoney.com forward slash mastermind. Now get ready because here we go. Chase Jarvis, my friend, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for uh, having me, Chris. Really appreciate it. Totally my pleasure. So one of the cool things about my show is we actually start the show with rapid fire because I feel like it's a really fun way to help my listeners get to know you in a hurry. And if something really good comes up, we'll just circle back around on it um, once we get into the more meaningful, deeper questions. How's that sound? Sounds good. I got my knees bent. (laughs) Here we go. Real easy. Where'd you grow up? Grew up in Seattle. And where do you live now? I live in Seattle. Hard place to leave, huh? <laughs> yeah, it's funny. I've just been splitting my time between Seattle and San Francisco, actually over-indexing on San Francisco for the previous five, maybe six years uh, because of, of Create a Live, my startup. Um, but just was able to ex- extricate a little bit and spend more time up in Seattle. Uh, it's my favorite place, the fam- favorite city on the planet. So it's a good place to be from. Um, and of course, do a lot of travel with work. But Seattle is home. So beautiful. I don't blame you. What's your favorite quote? Whether you think you can or think you can't, you're right. That is the truest of quotes on the planet. And I wish more people understood that. What is one of your superpowers? Synthesizing a lot of information into very focused, consumable um, bits. So... Like today, we're going to talk about creativity, and creativity is clearly it's a massive, you know, it's a massive topic. Uh, but it, I assure you, it doesn't mean just art. Creativity is in everything that we do. So taking a big concept and making it consumable and actionable. Man, that's valuable. What's one of your favorite books other than your hot new book that's out? <laughs> mm, gosh, it's very hard for me because all my friend, all my friends I know. are it's so like choosing a best friend. Yeah, seriously. I, I, I'm going to go a different route than I have historically gone because I usually will name business books or books that have, you know, affected the trajectory of my business or my soul or my, uh, uh, you know, some, um, I guess, peak performance thing. But I'm going to I'm going to change here and I'm going to say the first book from my friend Brandon Stanton. Uh, he is the creator of a site called Humans of New York, and Humans of New York chronicles the lives of everyday people on the streets of New York. And he photographs them and tells beautiful stories after after interviewing them. Um, he's you know he, he's got some like thirty or forty million followers. He's just absolutely ginormous. But he started from just like we all did from one particular you know it started taking pictures and and um, and then just you know posting a little caption. And now it is just a force of nature. He's donated tens of millions of dollars. Um, he's just transformed entire cultures and subcultures and cities around the world. Uh, and it's just, if you're not familiar with his work, he's got a couple of books out. Um, just look up Humans of New York. And it's it's lighter than I would normally answer this question. It's got some, uh, there's also, I guess, some heaviness, but, but it's a beautiful book and um, it will connect you to your humanity in a way that few things can. And I actually know the book and it is such a beautiful project. And I think it's you know, what we're going to talk about in a little bit here, it's such a beautiful example of flexing your creative muscle to be wildly successful and do good in the world. And I love yeah, that. Yeah, he, he quit He quit his job as a bond trader. Just to give you a little background on Brandon, he quit his job as a bond trader. Actually, strike that, he was fired from his job as a bond trader in Chicago, moved to New York, lived out on a mattress on the floor in a sublet apartment, started doing what he loved with his time. And now, again, he, like, he's so wealthy in every sense of the word and um, gets to give millions and tens of millions of dollars, I think, back. Um, And I know that's a huge emphasis for you and your community is using money as a tool. And he just does it so beautifully. I think that's one of the reasons I wanted to share his book. Yeah, I love that. I'm glad you did. A couple more here. What's one thing you're challenged by right now? 
this is are you ready for a confession? Is this, yes. this is, no, this we're ready. Early, too early in the show to to uh, the sooner the better. Let's get vulnerable. Uh, all right. It was such a uh, a head trip writing a book about creativity because the book writing was such a creative process, and um, I had to take my own medicine. And I guess that's proof that it works, right? It's mm-hmm. out and it's, 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 doing, it's doing well. So, um, but I, I think there's there's two two takeaways there. Um, one is that sometimes we think of we can short circuit a process we think we can skip steps and and in some ways you can but those are lightweight like um usually less meaningful both steps and building a business that you love building a life that you love creating wealth so that you can do what you want with that wealth of course there's a there are direct and less direct routes but you can't really skip any steps and some of these things that are process and it's a creative process whether it's building a business or writing a book and there were times that I tried to shortcut my own process, and it just didn't do me well. And so I got a I got a fistful of my own medicine in in the process of this book. So that was a huge challenge. And now that the book is <laughs> the book is done, I'm I'm just sort of coming out from my um my kicking my own ass, if you will. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it 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 um it was a great piece of of humble pie. So eating my eating my medicine with the sugar. Yeah. Hey, listen, like you said, it's proof it works. I remember watching Lori write hers. And people think writing a book is romantic. Like you're gonna be inspired all the time and the words are gonna pour out of you and you can't wait and you you know, you're gonna get a book deal and all night. And it is the opposite. It is is like sitting down when you don't feel like it and going through the reps to see if anything good comes out, whether it does or doesn't. And it's gotta become like a habit. Is that right? Yeah. And it is. And, and I think that's what actually is one of the things that I was referencing when I said, you know, it's like I had to go to the process and the process is sitting down to do the work. And sometimes we like certain parts of the process and more than others. And there are some things we can delegate. I had a lot of help on the book, but the reality is that as the creator or the leader, and when you're trying to create the living and life that you want for yourself, you got to put in the reps. And sometimes, you know, I guess, what is it? You know, creativity has to find us working, and and it doesn't just—it's not lightning in a bottle. It usually shows up when you've been putting in the hours, and and that's like anything. You know, that's I think my macro point is there's a we try and short circuit some things, and we can accelerate learning, or we can accelerate different aspects of our our lives or some process. But you have to you have to put in the licks, and you watched Lori do that, so that's my humble. <laughs> <laughs> my piece of hum- humble pie is I really thought I might have been, been able to, as someone who's theoretically mastered uh, his own creativity, especially in, in photography and rebuilding businesses. But I just, I got fed my own medicine trying to, to do a book and I'm happy where it landed, but it was, um, it was not easy. Man, I know, I know. Two more. What is something generous you've done recently? I don't know if well, I'm just going to go for it. I, don't, I was just going to say I don't know if I can talk about this, but depending on when this thing drops, and I, speaking of vulnerable, I'll go out there. I'm, I'm putting it putting it out there in the world. This will be the first time I've said this um, anywhere public. Is one of the ways in which our school system lets us down is in, is through creativity, and there's a belief that creativity is just art and popsicle sticks and pipe cleaners. But building a business, um, all of the things that that. Anytime you have a decision to make, go right or left, go up or down, um, putting two things together or solving a business problem in the way that only you can or that, that you have a new vision, all that's creativity at work. And um, I think a lot of that starts with schools. And so I am in the process of trying to buy a book for every school teacher in the Seattle Public Schools, which there's 3,209, I think, teachers across 113 schools. And so I believe that if I can get this book in the hands of these teachers, you'd think I'd want it in the students, and of course I do, but I think I really want to get it in the hands of teachers who can help. It's basically a new new lens through which we can look at creativity and use it to power our lives and, and transform our lives into what we want. Um, so that's a you know I'm, I'm uh, that's that's the project within the project here of sharing the book with the world is trying to get into the hands of a people who can't afford it otherwise and be where we can create some leverage and and help change the world man so. that is really cool thank you thank you for sharing that with us so you know I'm, I'm honored that you shared it here for the first time that's really <laughs> yeah, cool, now, a cool thing to do 
now it's now it's out there. Now I got to deliver. Right? Yeah, now, now the pressure's yeah. on. Is that the best way to get something done, though? Let's be yeah. honest. Like, tell yeah. you know, make it quote Facebook official. Remember when that was a thing like ten years ago? <laughs> oh, yeah, so, holds you to it. And I also like the 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 next layer is I'm trying to use this as a model on how I could do it in other cities. Um, so we'll see. I think it's a really smart model. Here's why: the fact that you're using teachers as a leverage point. Uh, you know, if the average teacher touches I don't know, 100 students, I don't know what the real number is, so I'm just making it up. Then when you get 3,200 books in the hands of 3,200 teachers, it's really like getting it into the hands of, you know, what's the math there? That'd be 3,320,000. 3, yeah, yeah, exactly. Isn't that wild? Yep. So I love that. Hey, let's go a little bit deeper now because obviously we've touched a lot on you being a creative and that wasn't the path that you were, quote, destined to, to necessarily follow through with. Matter of fact, there's a really interesting story of how you, quote, found your passion for photography and it had something to do with your grandfather. Would you mind sharing that story with listeners? Sure. So I think I'm going to go back to my second grade teacher. Her name was Miss Kelly. And Miss Kelly was awesome. I love Miss Kelly. I also, in the second grade, loved... I had a comic strip that I did every week and I would distribute it around my classroom. Um, I used to perform magic tricks. I had magic tricks. I had a little stand-up comedy routine. Oh my God. Um, yeah, I, I I didn't even know that that was sort of creative relative to anything else because all my all my friends they seemed just as interested in their own creative things and and you know I think if at the time you ask any second grade classroom who wants to come to the front of the room and draw me a picture you know every hand goes up mm -hmm. so I didn't I didn't think of myself as different and and yet I I went to this parent teacher conference in second grade and I overheard Miss Kelly tell my mom that Chase is better at sports than he is at art. Whoa. And she didn't mean anything by it. It was more kind of a casual uh, thing. But, it, you know, my second-year-old self, or second-grade self, is like, what do you want to do as a second second grader? You just want to fit in. That's, mm -hmm. you know, we're, we're, we're social animals. And, and so I did what was very natural to a, a young kid who wants to fit in. You just run where you think you'll be accepted. And... So I basically, in that moment, turned my back on a lot of those activities and the practices that I was doing at the time, which sadly happens to so many kids. And the funny thing is that, again, we, we associate creativity with art, but creativity is this muscle that we have, and it's the most powerful muscle in the human universe, that and love. And the, our ability to create new things is one of the things that separates us from all the other species on the planet. So harnessing that is not just like, oh, you're going to be good at art. It's you'll be able to solve problems and, and basically make anything, manifest anything in your life through creativity. Just, you know, creativity at different scales and focused on different outputs. And so if you think about that second grade me, and, and uh, you know, again, I did go on to have a successful career as an athlete. I went to college on a soccer scholarship, played division one and, and on the Olympic development team. And um, I, I don't want to, throw rocks at that. It was it was amazing. But the whole time I felt like I was denying this really creative part of myself that that Miss Kelly unwittingly or unknowingly rather had had talked me out of. And then, as you said in your um your little opening salvo there with the question, um the week before my college graduation, my grandfather, who was an avid photographer and had been taking photographs of me and my friends, through, throughout my, my life and childhood. And it was very inspirational to, to look at pictures. And uh, um, he dropped dead of a heart attack. No, like no signs before that of, of ill health or anything. And it was just a crusher. And the, the silver lining is that I was given his cameras. And, it, you know, a part of, you know, huge traumatic moments where we lose someone or sometimes in the positive moments where the birth of a child or, and this is a little bit how, how human lives work. Um, it causes us to pause and reflect. Mm -hmm. And for me, for me, it was like, you know, and I, it wasn't like I knew from that very moment that I was going to go on to, you know, have a long successful career as a photographer and start to build businesses around creative endeavors. And I had no idea, but I knew that I was denying something fundamental about myself because I was told by culture that you should do this, you have to do this, you ought to do this. And usually in those circles and at the cultural level, that programming is not like, hey, you know, you should really explore whatever you want to explore in life. 
because our parents and then people close to us, they want to, they want us to be okay and safe. So they steer us towards something that's very safe, sort of toward the middle, towards what everybody else's kids are doing, towards go to college, get a good job, work for 40 years, get the gold watch. And, and especially the previous generation, that's what they did. They and so doing us a favor, right? Right, right. They do. And, and, it's easy to see if you step back, but when you're, you know, a young person and that, that those, those things, those forces are very powerful. So, you know, I think that's part of what this book is about is how to recognize those forces for not evil, but as they're, they are a relic. They are an, uh, um, an artifact of the past that is trying to shape you for the future that is, that is doing you no favors. And so as I, you know, look at the moment of my grandfather's passing and that traumatic event helping me pause, it was through that moment that I was able to actually break through and and tune out some of those voices and just say, great, I'm going to pick up a camera. And I had saved up my money and bought the crappiest airline ticket you could possibly, you know, 13 stops to get to Europe kind of thing. <laughs> Half on miles, half on dollars, and and uh, and I basically lived out of a bag and traveled through Europe with my then girlfriend, now wife Kate, and and taught myself how to be a photographer. But it was more than just how to be a photographer. It was that I had agency over my own life. I could do. I had the tools and the raw materials to pursue my dreams, regardless of what anyone else had to say about it. You know that that statement right there. I had agency over my own life. Most people don't wake up feeling that way every day. Matter of fact, once I heard you say, or maybe I read it, I can't remember, something along the lines of you had spent years of your life and tens of thousands of dollars chasing everybody else's dream for what you were supposed to become rather than chasing your own. And it was kind of this, your grandfather's sudden passing along with the gift of his cameras that turned you into this person who went on to win these you know, multiple, multiple, multiple awards as a creative. And none of that would have yeah. happened without... I, I'm hearing two things. One, the very unfortunate event of, of yeah. your grandfather's sudden passing. But then two, you making that moment of pause and reflection and, and that bold choice, yeah. which is the antithesis to the choice that most people make, that bold choice to say, you know what, forget everyone else's plan for me. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm doing me. It's uh, Yeah. Thank you for acknowledging that. And the, the I don't want to gold plate it because it sounds like I, it, it's easy to look and feel brave looking backwards now. I was in the moment I was terrified. Who am I going to disappoint? How am I going to explain this? And honestly, it got worse. Like I was so energized traveling to Europe doing the thing that, you know, that I had been sort of repressing for the past, you know, 10 plus years of my life. And it again, I didn't have this huge aspiration of dropping everything and you know, and, and I don't want to paint this sort of like um overpaint the moment, but I was scared that I was disappointing everybody, especially when I came back to Europe and was like, you know what? I actually this is something that's interesting to me because what are the what are the messages that we feed ourselves? Oh my gosh, my parents who supported me, my um, grandfather who told me I should become a doctor or a lawyer or a you know a fill in the blank, some other very predictable, still respected thing. And yours was going to be med school, right? By the way. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I was pursuing all these other things concurrent to this photography. The photography was really a hobby. And I was just in Europe taking a little break between college and medical school. And, you know, also I had the opportunity to play pro soccer at, at and like, to, I just didn't want to do that. I was burned out. My college, you know, it was a great, great uh, experience. But I thought that there was something more that I could do with my life. And when you're doing all these things in the face of people that you respect, this is the thing. It's not like the bully on the playground is telling you not to do this. This is your parents, your spouse, your peers, <laughs> like everybody in your friend circle is like, oh, you're crazy. You go to go play pro soccer, go be a whatever. And but that's their version of your life. So while you know, I appreciate you acknowledging this and it, like ultimately I did make the, the right choice, I don't want to pretend that it was easy and for the listeners at home right now, like there is something you're supposed to be doing that you're not doing right now. And I'm not here to tell you some lie about how easy it's going to be. But what I am here to tell you is that when you start doing that thing, it's an amazing feeling. And the world starts opening up for you. Things start happening for you, not to you. And you start to understand your own narrative. And you start to, to, to echo the 
sentiment that you shared just a second ago, Chris, about agency, you start to realize that, wait a minute, just by creating small things on a daily basis, whether that's taking pictures or cooking meals with intention, or you start to build that business that everyone told you you were crazy to build, it's a signal for something bigger. It's a signal that you have agency over your life. And when you start to create your life, amazing things happen. It's amazing. Okay, so I, I would imagine that there are thousands, if not millions of people that are trapped right now where they feel that calling. You're, you're, you're motivating them. They're hearing your message, yet they're not ready to burn their boats. What is your advice directly to them? I want you to know that it never starts with burning your boats. It starts with a whisper. And especially if culturally we're told to ignore this whisper because starting your own business, well, don't you know that 90% of businesses go out of business in the first five years? Fear, 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 right? That's what we hear fear, when we bring it up. Fear. Right. And what you're doing, especially when it's coming from people that you love and pop culture in general, it has a very powerful effect. And when you, you know, this belief that you have to go all in and push your chips on red and burn the boat and get a second, take out a second mortgage in your house to start the business. And, you know, that's just not how 99% of the most successful things in the world started. They started with a whisper, hearing an intimation. You know, just think of the hero's journey, right? The Joseph Campbell, like the, the, the hero ignores the call at the beginning, right? They, you know, think of Star Wars, Luke Skywalker, he doesn't go on to leave Tatooine. It's only because some, you know, random, you know, um, thing happens that causes him to think about that, that opportunity that he has to go pursue the, this thing that's going to, that, that's calling to him. So it's not abnormal. If you're right now, you've turned into something and you're like, oh, cool, I want to do this. And then it's, you get scared and that's okay. I, I want to stop gold plating all this stuff that just says you beat your chest and you look at the mountain and you run up it and everything is fine. <laughs> and so it's okay if it's if it comes in fits and starts. The most important thing is the starting part of the fits and starts. Mm. Just continue to start and start before you're ready. When you start to hear that call, that whisper, Every every attempt, even if it's sort of a, a halted attempt, is progress. Even if it's two steps forward, one step back, that's what is. Uh, you know, we have a, a very powerful myth in our culture about you know entrepreneurs going all in. And you know, Richard Branson is uh, a bit of a mentor. He's an investor in Creative Live, and you know, he's he's given me a lot of wisdom over the time that we've spent together. And and he's. What people don't know, for example, when he started um, Virgin uh, Atlantic Air Airways, he he arranged to be able to sell the plane that he purchased. He bought a U-747. He arranged to be able to pre-negotiate a buyback price in case it didn't work. Oh, wow. So he wasn't really... I mean, I don't know how much a 747 costs. Let's say $100 million. He wasn't really betting $100 million. He might have been betting nine, $10 million. And 90, if it didn't work, he could sell the plane back. And so those are just parts of, you know, the, the lore of a person like Richard Branson that you just don't hear. That he's, he's sort of, he's protecting the downside and he's trying to stay at the table and play a lot, play more hands and take, get a lot of at bats and he's learning. And, and it seems like that's actually the ability to be dynamic and flexible when things come up because they will. The world is an imperfect place. And, and it's just a narrative that we're not told. So I want to, if you're listening at home, just start and keep starting. And when you get blocked, keep moving. That is the secret to finding your way in the world. And, you know, again, if you go back to the macro of the book, the book is called Creative Calling. And I've couched all of these things as in our own human DNA that we're wired to create. And the same thing is true. Like you could couch this in a lot of different things. What it is doing, though, is saying you have agency over your life. You are designed like that's a function of being a human. So stop denying it. Pay attention to those things. And if you believe these three principles, one, that you're creative. Okay, just take my word for it. If you, if you need to go with me for a second, go with me. We're all creative. Two, that creativity is a habit. It's not a skill. It's a, it's a process, not a product. It's like a muscle right? Creativity is a muscle. The more you use it, the stronger it gets. So if you believe one, you're creator. You believe that you can get more creative with experience. Then thing three, that every time you create something, 
whether it's dinner, whether it's a business, whether it's that first halted attempt at playing the guitar, watching Lori's Instagram feed, and watching <laughs> yes. playing the guitar, for example, that when you start to create on, the, on that level on a regular basis, that's when you start to fully understand the power that you have to create your own life. Oh, man, I love that. I absolutely love that. You know, one thing I'm excited to get your take on because, and I just want to frame it for everybody as a creative, as a creator, you've been financially massively successful. I mean, Creative Live, the, the online platform that teaches creatives how to be creatives, is, is that the world's largest online educational platform? Yeah, specific, specifically focused for creators and entrepreneurs. There, there are other learning platforms like LinkedIn Learning, for example, or, um, Udemy, where they have made more students or more classes, but we're specifically targeted to this in, to be in service to people who identify as creative and who want to build their own business. So it's where folks like Richard Branson, Tim Ferriss, Brene Brown, and the top creators and entrepreneurs in all these different disciplines of photography, design, and and entrepreneurship, it's where like you know the Gary Vees and the Ariana Huffingtons. That is to me what's just amazing is the focus because you can sort of like you can go to school and you can learn a little bit of everything a little bit of geology and a little <laughs> a little bit of health and but um at creative live this is where where we are in service of that particular community people who identify as creative or entrepreneurial man i love that so as someone who co-founded this this juggernaut and it was obviously massively successful as a result what do you think about this notion out there that comes up a lot that creatives have to starve or they have to pay their dues for ages before making any real money? You know, they call it what? Starving artist syndrome. <laughs> so what are your yeah. thoughts on this? Uh, lovely question, Kristen. I, I gotta, I'm going to throw some rocks for a second. I don't do this all that often, but I like and it. I'm not, Start I'm not going to throw, throw them at any one individual, but it is a myth. It was, it came out of, um, Paris early in the century, uh, early in the last century, where it's just, it's, it's, it's literally a story. And the story was sort of an excuse for people to not be, uh, to be sort of creating, but not pursuing a dream. It was sort of like avoidance rather than pursuing. Mm -hmm. And, and you can trace, you know, the concept back to literally this, this time in Paris. And in fact, you can trace it back to a cafe called Le Dumago, um, where you know these famous authors, the the, uh, the Simone de Beauvoir and Jean Paul Sartre, and used to used to get together and hang out, and it's just so toxic because it has this um, this effect of of conditioning our culture. All talking about our parents or grandparents or career counselors or whoever we look to for advice about you know the nature of pursuing creativity. And ironically, you know, we can look at entrepreneurship and think it's sexy and and risky, and you know that's where billionaires are made. And but that's just that's just creativity, <laughs> you know, just creativity through the lens of building a business. So it's weird that the thing that we put on a pedestal and the thing that we say, oh, this is doing this is so risky. You wouldn't want to, you know, pursue a career as a photographer or designer. It's the same set of muscles, <laughs> and yet we have a different cultural explication of, of why one would be successful and one's not. So I'm there's no one person or one universe to throw rocks at, but it is a toxic myth. And the reality is that everything around you was created. The chair you're sitting in right now, the, the you know, if you're jogging while you're listening to this, the shoes that are on your feet, uh, the the beautiful piece of architecture you just ran by, all these things were created. And the reality is they were created by somebody no smarter than you, no more creativity, no the same capacity for creating as you have. They just chose to invest in it. And whether it's a business that you admire, someone on the internet or a particular entrepreneur or you know whatever you admire, that is literally and quite literally using the word literally, that is creativity. But we're just sold this myth about creativity that it's, oh, business is business. And then there's art and the, you know, the artists are going to starve and it's business people are going to make a lot of money. That's just fundamentally not true. It's so I'm trying to categories. That's amazing. Right. Yeah. I'm trying to rewrite the cultural narrative with this book and 
when you do realize that, wait a minute, I am creating everything, this business or this promo or the video that I want people to look at to understand my brand, my personal brand or my work. Like when you start to understand that's creative and you can take on, no, I am creative, that it's so empowering. And I'm not saying you don't have to move to Paris, no wearing a beret, you don't have to smoke cigarettes, you don't have to live in a loft. All these things are just toxic myths. But what you do have to do is when you acknowledge that you're a creator, all you're really saying is that I can create the life of my dreams. In fact, it's like it's only me that can create it. And any out, outside circumstances that may come along, great. That's temporary. If you're truly creating something, you're doing it on a, you know, on an ongoing basis, and you're carving your way through life intentionally, rather than just bobbing like a, a cork in the tide. Of all the times I've asked about that subject, by the way, the starving artist syndrome, I've never heard the actual story where it originated like that. That's fascinating. Yeah, um, it's, I don't know. It's it's a little little nerdy to know about that stuff, but I look no, at it as that's my... <laughs> awesome. That's really cool. So obviously, this is why you've you've written the book, Creative Calling, and and everybody I know they're really excited about it. But here's what else I know. Writing a book, and you started to allude this when I said, you know, what challenges you right now? Writing a book is a beastly commitment. And well, you have no shortage of other really great things going on. So why was now the time for you to write this book? <laughs> uh, small, small story time here. Okay, so my... I've had a book agent for a number of years. And we originally started... Um, rallying around this idea of of writing a book about creativity that would help it you know every book that i've had read up to now about creativity was just as pretentious as hell and inaccessible and it really painted creativity as art and you know all the beret and the cigarettes and zippery and all that kind of stuff that i was just making fun of and so i had this you know i really that was the stake in the ground that i had a long time ago and at some point, and I think people, you know, think about you can look backwards to something where you finally had had enough and you just had to do the thing, whatever it was. And maybe a friend talks to smack or you saw timing in the marketplace or what I just I had to just put this out in the world. And um it, you know, again, a, a lifetime worth of work and three or four years worth of commiserating with my literary agent one weekend. I just sat down and wrote what I call, my wife and I talk about it like this, I wrote an eighth grade book report on what I would want my book to be. <laughs> and normally when you do, you know, for the few people who have done, you know, book pitches or whatever, and, you know, I'm sure you, you watched Lori do this, like, usually it's it's a pretty major product project. It's a process in its own self. You like you're researching and writing sample chapters. And what I did is just, I, I wrote what I called an eighth grade book report. And I sent it to my agent on Monday and I said, I got to get this thing out of me. I know this is like, this is just the, the this, this goes back to a point I made earlier, just like starting. And I, I just threw it down on paper and I want you to react to it. And he was like, dude, <laughs> like we have to get this in the market immediately. And I said, well, that's a good thing that you said that because I'm about to burst. I got to get this thing out of here, this thing out of me. And it did turn out, I think this was a uh, spidey sense and instinct that, the timing on this is so good because even 10 years ago, the book couldn't have been written because most of the tools that we take for granted were not available. You wouldn't have had your own show, Chris. And, you know, we couldn't have been talking to tens of thousands of people right now. And the tools have become cheap or free. The, the belief that you didn't have to just, you know, do the work that everybody else said you had to work, do and, you know, be working on a factory line. Uh, in a in a cubicle somewhere or whatever. So the reality is that I just felt radically compelled based on the timing. And I had seen both my own experience. I want to say three things. I'd seen three things. One, my own experience. It was completely different than what I was reading about and how to make your way in the world and the tools that were available to us and how important community was. Second, I had a podcast of my own that I've had for 10 years now called Chase Travis Live Show where I've been sitting down with these the Brene's and the Sir Richards and the Gary V's and you know a lot of the friends that you and I have in common, for example. And this pattern was emerging. And it's like, wait a minute. The folks that I'm inspired by and energized by were following this basic the same pattern. And then this was the, the tipping point was just watching the momentum that Creative Live had gathered and to look at, you know, tens of millions of people 
following this new universe where they really can pursue their dreams and they have to take some risks. But these risks are arguably less than the risk that they would take to follow the path that their parents were trying to push them on to fulfill, to find fulfillment, to find joy and the life that they'd always wanted. And so I was like, wait a minute, the, this is the, the universe is telling me I got to put this on paper. And so uh, my eighth grade book report, uh, I'd say 10 days later, I had, a, I, had, I had my book deal. And it was, um, yeah, it was just the timing in the marketplace. That is so cool. What did you learn about yourself writing this book? The number one lesson. Number one lesson, um, your instincts, your instincts, you have to trust. And we're taught to repress those instincts, to ignore that voice that says what, what's the right path. And the reason is, is because the right path for you is not the right path for your career counselor or all these other people who they don't wish bad for you. But they're giving you the advice that they needed, not the advice that you need. Mm. And the reality is that you have this voice inside you. It's the same voice that tells you what you're really supposed to be doing with your life right now. That also helps you navigate these small turns along the way. And in listening to that voice, you uh, it, it's, it's just such a powerful force. You know, they science is coming out. It very clearly says that that um, rational thought, our brains, our mind if you will, is, is pretty slow. It's laden with bias. It's very imperfect. And what is becoming more well-known is that intelligence isn't just in the brain. Intelligence is in the body. And all of every experience you have is recorded in all of the cells of your body. Like, what does it feel right now on the back of your, the, you know, the, the, the back of your knee? You can feel what, it, what your genes feel like on the back of your knee. You're not paying attention to that right now because you couldn't possibly be doing what you're doing, driving or running or whatever, if you were paying attention to what your genes felt like on the back of your knee. But your body's taking in that information. So we start to listen to our whole body. That's why they call it a gut feeling, not a, not a head feeling, not a thought. It's a gut feeling because it's an, it's, a, it's an intelligence that we all have. So there's so many times in the book process, like what the package was going to be like and but you know the the order of the chapters and why this and not that that I was just continually tested as we all are to listen to our gut. Did you have to? Did you have some moments where you really had to push back? You know, because you're going to stand by <laughs> your gut. And let's say your publisher, I'm just making this up. I don't know, but your publisher mm-hmm. was like, "No, that we don't want that cover. Or you should, your face should be on it, or things like that." <laughs> Everything you just said is true. Yeah, I, have, <laughs> really I use the example because Lori went through that. <laughs> down to the down to your face needs to be on the cover. I'm yep. Like, yeah, yeah. Lori did not have hers on hers because she just didn't feel that it was right uh, for her particular book this time. You know, so, totally. And I'm not saying I won't do it in the future. And a lot of people have done it in the past, and it's worked out well. Um, but again, like that's the, you know, I, get, I just keep talking about the, these cultural and to say pressures. I mean, people have real real hardcore pressures in life. There are people, there's a billion people on this planet who don't have access to clean drinking water. Yeah. So I want to keep this in perspective. But if I'm white male, born in America in the 1970s, I basically come from every ben- every privilege that you can. And making these choices was still the hardest thing I'd ever done in my life. Disappointing people that were close to me and having people not understand the vision that I had for my own life only until after you've achieved it do then they like, oh yeah, of course, right? Of course. And so, you know, I want to both acknowledge my privilege, but also at the same time, just say like, these, it's like following your guts and your intuition, like that is not a thing that we're taught in school. It is not a cultural narrative that people are quick to like, yep, yeah, your, your, your gut knows, your instinct is always right. And I'm trying to help us listen to that. That was a, a huge learning thing for me. And the irony was like, I, I wrote extensively about this in the book. That's just so an ask. This is probably a huge yeah. topic of the book, isn't it? It is. And there I was taking, you know, having to like, wait a minute, what would I, what, would, what advice would I give myself? And I just have to turn back to page 37. Like, oh, there it is right there. I wrote it. And then it would give me guidance on what to do next. Will this book empower people to trust their gut more to be a little bit braver in that area? For sure. And, I think naming some of these forces is really important. Words matter. And we talk about, oh, it's risky. 
risky relative to what? Relative to watching the stock market? Relative to going to medical school? Relative to what? What's risky is trying to play it safe doing somebody else's version of you. That's the riskiest thing you could possibly do. So when people are telling you how risky it is to pursue your dreams, what they really mean is that something that they would be scared to do and that they don't understand. And you can't blame them for that. What you can do is you can bring them along, you can go to work, helping them understand. But at the end of the day, when you start listening to yourself and prioritizing those things, it's sort of like put your own oxygen mask on before assisting other passengers. When you listen to that safety mm-hmm. video, airplane, these things, they, they unlock huge new you know swaths of experience for us because the world tries to impose averages on you. It wants you to make an average income, to have an average amount of joy, to take an average vacation, to take an, you know, to all of these things are averages. That's really what an average is. It's an aggregate of everybody divided, you know, the total sum divided by the number of people. And, but you know what? Like that, that, that has nothing to do with you. If you started listening to you, you're, you're, in, there is no average for you because there's a data set of one. It's just you. And that is what you need to be do, doing. You need to be unapologetically you. And when you start to do this, you build this. Real, and and I know you know this, Chris, because of you know so many things that have been successful in your career, like the the podcast or your business or your masterminds. Like you, it's a long list. In all those cases, you were challenged. You had to listen to what was in your gut. And when you started doing that and it started paying dividends, it's not to say that these shoulds go away. There's always some shits there. They change as you get older or you get pressures. You're like, oh, yeah, I got a mortgage. I got a couple of kids. I got, and then you create different shits. But the fact remains that you know best. And what is, I think, the highest calling that we have, speaking of our creative calling, the highest calling is to be unapologetically who we're supposed to be. Don't be a second class LeBron James or a second class Chris Harder. Be the first class you. Yeah. Oh, man, I love that. So you mentioned earlier that everyone is a creative. Now, if I were to take a real quick survey, I would feel like just over half my listeners would label themselves a creative. And then you did a masterful job of saying, listen, if you're building a business, it's a form of creativity. If you're an entrepreneur, it's a form of creative. So you've already kind of bridged this gap. But to those who just don't feel like a creative yet, they, they haven't put themselves in that category. Give them, speak to them. Give them a compelling reason to go grab this book and give it a chance. Sure. Just go back to Miss Kelly. Her simple programming that told me that I was better at sports than at art, she didn't intend to tell me to not create. It, it was, again, part of the cultural narrative of that time. You can also look at my mom, who, you know, I did the first iPhone app that shared photos to social networks. Obviously, that's a pretty big cultural phenomenon now, but people thought I was totally crazy because I was a professional photographer using hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of equipment to shoot for Apple and Nike and all these people. And yet I found a lot of joy with my iPhone, started taking pictures with that, created a little app. I gave it to my mom, among other things. It was, you know, millions of downloads, but I like, hey mom. And my mom had really never thought of herself as creative. And in a matter of it's not days, not minutes, but weeks, not months or years, weeks. She started just taking pictures while she was on her daily walk. And she started sharing those with her friends and on Facebook and tweeting them and texting them. And she went in a matter of weeks from A, not believing that she was creative and having her friend circle not think of her in those terms to arguably like the most creative of all her friends. People just turn and like, oh my gosh, there's this part of you that I had no idea. And I watched it, Chris. This is absolute true as nails. I watched it change how she thought about cooking. It changed her travel. She started like adventuring, like going beyond just the traditional vacations that she'd been taking for 25 years. I watched it change how she dressed, how she moved through the world. It was so powerful. And that's not to take her career away. She was an administrator at a biotech company. You know, she was in administration at a very science oriented thing. But just by acknowledging that she could create both things in her life whether they're moments or meals or photographs or whatever, that she had more agency over her life with a capital L or creativity with a capital C. So I'm not asking you again to to wear a beret. That's not what I mean. What I'm asking you to do is to unequivocally acknowledge that you have 
creativity inside you. Everybody does. Look at any first grade classroom. And it's understandable that we've had these things trained out of us. Just start to acknowledge it in small daily ways. And you will find out that it will unlock huge pieces of your life, your personality, your personal superpowers that you never knew existed. I love it. Like this book could be the catalyst that starts to scrape off some of these stories that we piled up along the way that we're not a creative. And, and this book could be the thing that finds maybe one of the happiest shifts in our life. Yeah. And it's also, it's repeatable. Like I, again, I'm using data from my own experiences and the, the people that I've already named, you've been on the podcast from Creative Live or who are in our friend circle. Like this is, it's basically the, the system that they use to think about creativity. I've just deconstructed it and packaged it in a way that's really helpful, both for, you know, for those folks who already know that they have you know, creativity inside them and they're building businesses. But just specifically to your question, for the people who are like, ah, I'm not so sure, just I promise it's going to unlock a piece of you and you don't have to change, you don't have to downgrade your lifestyle. If you're, you know, you're, you work or what are your CPA and you work for one of the big five and you make a ton of coin and you still, you know, you, you get to do what you want with your life and you put your money to work helping other people and giving back. I'm not asking you to change that at all. I'm asking you to change how you think of yourself and the labels that you use of what's possible for your life. Mm, man, I love that. I can't <laughs> wait to get my hands on this book. It's not out yet. When does it come out? Oh, it's by the time this drops, if you ordered it, it will be at your house in a matter of days. I can't so wait. I think, so yeah. for everybody else who hasn't ordered it, where it was the best place for them to find it? Any place you get books online. Um, and you know, ordering it now, I don't know what the stock will be um, in a week or two. So pre-orders, they really matter. And um, it's my hope that this will be an unlock for you in a way that I've watched it. This concept unlock um, the lives of millions of people on Creative Live and, and in our, our friend circle. So anywhere books are sold, you know, the Amazons, the Barnes and Nobles, the Apple books, the books a million, the ind- independent stores, all of them are selling it right now. Creative wow. Calling. I absolutely love it. Okay, Creative Calling. We'll make sure we put the link in the show notes. So before I ask you the last question, um, well, here's a no-brainer one. Where should everybody follow you? Hmm. I'm just at Chase Jarvis on the internet, pretty much everywhere. C-H-A-S-E-J-A-R-V, like Victor, I-S. Insta, YouTube, Twitter, Creative Live. It's just all one word. Check that out. That's their, web, you know, their website that we, where we host the, all of the thousands of classes and, and also on Insta and YouTube and all that stuff too. So those are two good places. The book has a pretty cool website where um, if you buy the, if you pre-order the book, you get access to a class that is just for people who pre-order. Hundred dollar value gets goes to zero. You get it's, and I'll have a bunch of fancy guests joining me um, on uh, the beginning of October. So pick up a copy before the twenty fourth, and you'll get led into that specific uh, exclusive class live. Where I'll, I'll be answering questions. Love it. Okay, we'll make sure we get the links to all of that in the show notes. So I've got a gift for you. It just kind of popped in my mind. I've got a gift for the audience. My gift to you is this. Um, I love your generosity component that you're going to get this book in the hands of each teacher in, you said, in the Seattle area? Yeah, Seattle yeah, Public School. All right, so, so Lori and I will contribute 100 of those books. Send me the invoice. Oh. We would love to contribute oh. 100 towards the 3,200 or whatever you said it is. Yeah. Oh, man. That is amazing, Chris. Totally our oh. pleasure. I love that you oh. have that component in there. It's the coolest thing ever. Thank and then, you so much, of man. Course, That's amazing. It's the least we can do. And then for everyone who's listening, here's what I want you to do. Uh, go on Instagram, share your favorite takeaway on stories from this episode. Make sure you tag both myself and Chase Jarvis. And for the first 10 people that do this when this drops, now that those are going to go by like in a matter of seconds, but for the first 10 people that tag both Chase and I in your stories with your biggest takeaway from this episode, I will personally send you guys a book as well. Only wow. for the first 10. Amazing, dude. <laughs> Thank you so much. Of course. Of course. My pleasure. So uh, here's the last question. You alluded to it before. And I was like, oh, wow. It's almost like he knows what the last one is. Why should people be unapologetic about their own individual pursuit of what success is to them? We are fed a bunch of information from a bunch of different sources in the world. And the information comes from people who mean well and from people who sometimes very generally, genuinely aspire to help. But here's the deal. There is only one you. Only you 
have the genetic makeup that you have. Only you, even more importantly, have lived the life that you'd had. And the combination of those things, your DNA and your experience, literally make you one of a kind. And that is the thing that needs to be celebrated. That is your superpower, is being unapologetically you. And for everybody, you're, you're going to be too loud for some people, too big, too small, too, <laughs> too crazy, too sane, too everything. Here's the deal. Those are not your people. Mm. Your people are out there. And when you start becoming more of who you are, these doors open and you're able to... It's, it's like you stepped on an elevator and went to a completely different floor where your people are and where your dreams are. And you can only do that by being you. You've felt it before. This is the thing that's why it's, it's not a tricky, it's not a hard thing to sell because you felt it when you were just relaxed and in the moment and unapologetically you. It seemed like the world was happening for you. You felt that flow feeling, even if it was for a minute or maybe it was for a week or that one particular year, that season of your life, what you were feeling is available to you right now. Mm, I love the analogy of it's like finally opening the elevator door on the floor you were meant to be on. That's amazing. So true. That's amazing. Great answer. My friend, thank you for being on. I can't thank you enough. Everybody, make sure you go order yourself a copy of Creative Calling. The first 10 of you that tag both Chase and I on Instagram and your stories with your biggest takeaway, I'll be sending you a free book for the first 10 of you. And my friend, Chase, I just can't say thank you enough for for your time, your expertise, uh, the knowledge that you shared and, and the breakthroughs that you created. Thank you, Chris. Uh, It was a treat to be on the show. Love what you've built. Super inspiring. And uh, I'm genuinely, genuinely so grateful. Thanks a lot, man. Completely my pleasure. Thanks for listening. And if you loved this episode and know of someone else who is as successful as they are generous, please pass them on to me. It would mean the world to me if you help me get this cause and this message out to as many listeners as I can. So please, if you liked what you heard, it goes a long way if you take 30 seconds and leave me a five-star review and share this with your friends. I'll be forever grateful. And until the next episode, cheers to your success.